presentation. Our next speakers are going to be uh, Stefan T. Jaronski, PhD, and Marsha L. Anderson, PhD, from the Jaronski Mycological Consulting LLC and EPA Center for Integrated Pest Management. Uh, their presentation is called The Fungus Among Us, Fungal Biopesticides, a Growing Option in Pest Control. In 2009, Marsha was an environmental protection specialist for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. In 2012, she moved to EPA headquarters, where she specialized in integrated pest management, bed bugs, rodents, and illegal pesticides. She earned two bachelors of science degrees, one in biology from Monmouth University, and the second in environmental design and landscape architecture from Rutgers University as a George H. Cook scholar. In 2003, she earned her Master's of Arts in Instructional and Curriculum Earth Science from Keene University and PhD in Environmental Management from Montclair State University in 2012. She worked as an adjunct professor for 15 years concurrently at three New Jersey universities, teaching Earth and Environmental Studies, Geology, Geography, and marine biology. In 2015, she moved from Texas to DC and continues to develop IPM webinars, write, and took two part-time duties with the Criminal Investigation Division to instruct CBP on illegal pesticides. Since COVID, she began working with 40 state departments of agriculture and many state departments of health, along with professional organizations, to have live EPA IPM webinars pre-approved for CEUs. Stefan Jaronski retired from the U.S. Department of Agriculture in 2019 after 20 years as an entomologist. Previously, he worked 19 years in the biopesticide industry. Throughout his career, Jaronski developed fungi and bacteria as insect control agents and was responsible for the registration of the first fungus as a mycoinsecticide on food crops. In retirement, Dr. Jaronski is an adjunct professor in entomology at the Virginia Tech University, Blacksburg, Virginia and has an active international consulting business advising companies and other enterprises about the development of these fungi. Perfect, it looks like our pres uh, presenters are here. I'll hand it over to you two. Okay, let me share my screen. Whoops, back one. Okay, well, thank you for having us. So to start, I'd like to give you a brief introduction to biopesticides and mycoinsecticides. Let's first start with biopesticides and they fall into three basic areas biochemical pesticides, and that includes naturally occurring substances that control pests. Um, and then microbial uh, pesticides, they're microorganisms that control pests. And then PIPs, or plant incorporated protectants. And they are pesticidal substances produced by plants containing added genetic materials. Generally, these all have a much lower risk profile than conventional pesticides. And there are over 400 of these biopesticide active ingredients. Some of them, uh, some examples of biopesticides that have been commonly used for many years are Bacillus thuringiensis or Bt, Bacillus Firmus and gibberellic acid. Well, grapes and strawberry crops benefit from the gibberellic acid and Bt, respectively. Other great examples of biopesticides use um, are Bacillus thuringiensis israelensis and Bacillus spherical spherical yeah. <laughs> Um, applied as a mos mosquito larvicide treatment. Sorry, my tongue got twisted on that one. Uh, some of the benefits of using biopesticides 
are that it's less of a likelihood of pests developing resistance to certain pesticides. They're also exempt from requiring tolerances. Tolerances are maximum legally permissible levels of pesticide residues, including active and inert ingredients and those that may be found in foods. In this case, the chemical is considered to be safe enough for the use described in the tolerance exemption that a maximum permissible level does not need to be established. Another benefit of using a biopesticide is that there's no pre-harvest interval. The pre-harvest interval or the PHI is the wait time between a pesticide application when a crop can be harvested. The label will state how long the crop must remain in the garden or field after spraying. During the pre-harvest interval, the pesticide may be broken down in the plant or on its surface. Things like sun, rain, and warm temperatures may affect how quickly this happens. Biopesticides also have substantially shorter re-entry intervals. And that is the minimum amount of time that must pass between the time a pesticide was applied to an area or crop and the time that people then can go back into that area without protecting protective clothing or equipment. As I mentioned, there are currently about 400 registered biopesticide active ingredients in the US. They include 57 species and or strains of microbes or their derivatives labeled for use against pestiferous insects, mites, and nematodes. Microbial pesticides comprise an important part of the biopesticide industry. Indeed, microbial products are the fastest growing product segment of the global biopesticide, biocontrol rather, industry. There are increasingly being adopted by medium and large companies and marketed to a wide range of agricultural crops. Registration requirements for biopesticides vary in different parts of the world. Here in the U.S., biopesticides are regulated through the Biopesticide and Pollution Prevention Division of the Environmental Protection Agency um, within the Office of Pesticide Programs. The agency is tasked to determine no unreasonable adverse effects to human and environmental health to permit the sale and distribution of pesticides under FIFRA, or the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, as well as reasonably certain of no harm under Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Microbial pesticides based on bacteria, fungi, and viruses, or their bioactive compounds have long been developed as an alternative for synthetic pesticides to control invertebrate pests. Concern for environmental and human health from excessive reliance on chemical pesticides, change in re residue standards, and increased demand for organically grown produce has contributed to a considerable growth in their use in recent years. Strange, strains of Bacillus thuringiensis for Lepidoptera remain the most popular products, but newer bacterial strains and their metabolites have been developed against a wider range of arthropods for use on fruit, vegetable, and ornamental crops. Currently, 10 fungal spe species or strains are registered against thrips, whiteflies, aphids, or other sucking pests and plant parasitic nematodes in greenhouses, nurseries, and field crops. So next, let's look at the characteristics of microbial pesticides. They 
survive and reproduce in the environment. The modes of action are variable and can include competition, inhibition, use of pests as growth substrate, and toxicity. Typically, they have a low mammalian toxicity. They are target specific and they have low use rates. The growing momentum for these biopesticides is stimulated by societal, governmental, and market-driven demands for less pesticide residue, residues on foods, decreased re reliance on synthetic pesticides, increased pest control tools comparable with organic agriculture, expansion and consolidation consolidation of integrated pest management programs, and the concerns about the impacts of pesticides on pollinators. As for the biopesticide market share, this is really important. The global biopesticide market is estimated to be valued at at least $5.5 billion in 2022. Projections to 2025 in indicate a market size of about $8 billion plus dollars. Integrated pest management is a complement and alternative to applying synthetic pesticides and a form of sustainable intensification. IPM steps result in lower pesticide use that will benefit not only the farmers, but environmentalists and human health. IPM incorporates the management and integration of numerous tactics, including the regular monitoring of pests and natural enemies, the use of thresholds for decisions, and also incorporates pesticide product management or even pesticide substitution when necessary. Consequent reduction in the use of synthetic pesticides improves on and off farm sustainability, as well as reducing the cost to the farmer. IPM is an example of sustainable intensification defined as producing more output from the same area of land while reducing the negative environmental impacts at the same time, increasing contributions to natural capital and the flow of environmental science. IPM is also worldwide. We'll be discussing IPM within the context of the use of these fungal biopesticides as we move along with our talk. With their parasitic lifestyles, Fungi can be exploited in biological control of pests. There are roughly 14 strains of fungi currently labeled for use against invertebrates. Fungi are the most common cause of microbial disease in invertebrates, insects, and arachnids like ticks and mites. The majority of entomopathogenic fungi infect arthropods by direct penetration of the cuticle. In other words, contact pathogens. They're pivotal in IPM programs because they can cause frequent epizootic diseases in specific pest populations, similar to like a plague within the species. Okay, epizootic disease is a disease event in an animal population akin to an epidemic in humans, which causes serious health issues and may affect the entire population of like organisms. Fungal biopesticides like mycoinsecticides and mycoacaricides are predominantly based on Bavaria species. Metahorizium species, Isaria species, and Lacardiacillum species. A good example of an invertebrate fungi fungal pathogen is Bavaria bassiana. Bavaria is a naturally soil inhabiting 
necrotic necrotophilic pathogen of a broad host arthropod range spanning almost all orders of insects insects and extending to ticks and mites it plays a key role in management of numerous arthropod arch ar agricultural veterinary and forest pests it is deployed through the application of large numbers of spores in dry or liquid formulations. Uh, Dr. Um, Stefan Jaronski is going to be talking more about this later. It is one tool in integrated pest management approach rather than a standalone management approach. About 40% of mycoinsecticides are based on Bavaria. More detailed analysis of fungal mycoinsecticides and modes of action will begin now as we transition to our lead presenter, Dr. Stefan Jaronski. Stefan, take it away. Okay, well, thank you, Marsha. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's see, uh, we've got a, oh, what's going on? Share screen. I'm having trouble sharing my screen. Hang on. There we go. I think we're getting there. There we go, finally. I have a lot of pop-up windows right now. Trying to, there we go. Okay. We can close you up. Okay. So the rest of the uh, session, we're going to be talking about these, these fungi. That, uh, the official term are mycoinsecticides or mycopesticides. Uh, and uh, what you're about to endure is what I call mycoinsecticides 101 uh, in the university environment. Okay. Um, okay. So let's meet the current players. Uh, Marsha, uh, alluded to them. Uh, we've got Bovaria, basically white fungus. We have a green cousin called Metarizium. We have a smoky gray cousin, if you will, Cordyceps. This is the one that used to be called Isaria, uh, but the uh, nomenclature has changed. And lastly, we've got uh, something that used to be called Lycanicillium, and now is called uh, Acanthomyces. Um, you can't tell the players without DNA these days, and that's why we've had these names changed. These are all uh, fungi belonging to the, the what they call the ascomycetes. Uh, they seem to have evolved um, really from generalist saprophytic uh, way of life, uh, in some cases colonizing the root systems, uh, such as metarizium. Other cases looks like uh, actually colonizing plants, being uh, plant endophytes as in the case of, of Bulvaria. And then over the uh, several tens of millions of years, these things have evolved to uh, exploit a new food source, i.e. insects. Okay, uh, these fungi, it's, it's not a new idea using fungi to control insects. It goes all the way back to 1880s in Russia. Uh, Mechnikov and Krasilichik had the first attempt to uh, actually grow uh, a, a metarizium fungus from a beetle uh, to control that beetle. They grew it up on beer mash, of all things, and uh, they made a, a brief attempt, but it was uh, subsequently abandoned. About the same time here in the United States, two entomologists, Lugar and Snow, who were working in Kansas and the general Midwest, saw uh, Bovaria, the white fungus, and you see a picture of it there, in chinch bugs. And they thought, hmm, maybe we can figure out how to use this fungus to uh, control the chinch bug. And what they did was they infected thousands and thousands of chinch bugs uh, very primitively. Uh, don't forget, this is the 1890s, um, and released them, sent them out to farmers and released them. And it didn't work uh, because really uh, they didn't understand, no one understood the ecology 
and the um, of these organisms. However, uh, this was the start, you know, as I say down at the bottom, maybe we can actually control insect pests with microbes. Today, uh, we've got many, many products all over the world. And here you see a few of them. Uh, in 2006, uh, a survey was made and they uh, found 110 active commercial products worldwide. I and a Brazilian colleague kind of repeated the survey in 2020 and we found over 200 just on the internet. And I know there are other uh, commercial products of these fungus, um, of these fungi that are not um, advertised on the internet. Uh, as uh, you can see, the preponderance of them are belong to what's called Metarhizium anisopli, think the green fungus, as well as Bovaria bassiana, the white fungus, easiest way to keep them apart. And you see here some of the product names. Uh, here's the uh, uh, strains that are uh, registered in US and Canada. Bovaria bassiana, we've got like seven strains. Actually, this last one here is registered in Canada and it's uh, in front of EPA now for US registration. We've got uh, one metarhizium, um, which is uh, was registered in the US. Now it is taken over by a, uh, a Canadian company. And there's another metarhizium that's under development uh, in Canada. Lastly, we've got the, these cordyceps, Fumosa rosea. There's two commercial products. Um, as you can see, Apopka 97, FE 9901. So these are what's available um, uh, with US uh, EPA registration. Now there's different strains and I'll get into that in a minute. Why different strains? But let's look at how do these fungi work? Think fatal athlete's foot or athlete's body of insects. The, they're contact agents, okay? Um, the, uh, in nature, they really are picked up mostly on the feet of the insect as, they, as the insect crawls along on plant surfaces, on the soil, um, and so on. That's why I like to call it fatal athlete's foot. Uh, the, the spore, when it lands on the cuticle of the insect, recognizes within a few minutes where it is, that it's on a potential host, and begins germinating. And the germination takes about 9, 12 hours, uh, at which, and you can see here a scanning electron micrograph uh, that's been colorized of some of these spores germinating on the cuticle of an insect. And uh, somewhere around 12 hours, 16 hours into the process, the fungus starts putting out a hypha and starts drilling down into the cuticle. Think of a, a oil well rig going down. And it uses a cocktail of enzymes as well as mechanical pressure uh, to penetrate down into the, the body of the insect. Once it does that, once it hits the uh, mother load, uh, it goes into like a yeast-like phase and colonizes the insect and kills the insect anywhere from four to 14 days. And that depends on the dose and also on the size of the insect. So white flies, tiny little white flies, they're dead in three days. Uh, uh, locusts, African locusts, take about two weeks to die. Okay, so the fungus, as the fungus grows through, kills the insect and, and uses a series of metabolites. Um, uh, but basically they, they starve the insect from the inside out, if you will. Uh, the, most of the metabolites that are produced uh, are really antibacterial, uh, antifungal agents uh, to sequester that insect body. Uh, for the use of the Bovaria or the, or the Metarhizium. As, as the insect is about to die, the fungus then starts growing as mycelium. So think, um, you know, on a bread mold, you see the white fungus or, or better yet, white rot fungus growing on decaying wood, that's mycelium. And it fills the body. And then if the conditions are right, uh, it produces, it emerges uh, as you see here on the left, which is a white fly nymph that's been killed by Bovaria and produces more spores and thus potentially can recycle. So this is the, the, the mode of action. So the important part of these things uh, is they're contact agents. They don't work really by ingestion, except uh, what happens is an insect ingests these spores um, they infect through the mouth. So in this case, it becomes fatal athlete's mouth. Um, and the insect dies from having the, the, 
the cuticle around the um, uh, mouth. And, um, okay, so uh, now here's a picture of Bovaria spore germinating on an insect cuticle. Look how it grows out. And you can see with the black arrow, how it's starting to penetrate, drill down into the insect cuticle. This is a, a glimpse of the fungus inside the insect. Uh, and th these are uh, yeast-like cells that the fungus uses to proliferate. Uh, now, once the insect is, is, is killed, uh, many times some of these in the insects take on a particular color. Uh, this is what I call metarhizium red. You can see the, the grasshopper has that red tint. Bovaria has more of a pink color. These are antimicrobial compounds. That, uh, that really sequester that dead insect for the use of the Bovaria or the Metarhizium. Uh, in three days, the fungus starts growing out through all the weak uh, uh, joints, the, what the, we call the intersegmental membranes. And you can see it there, the little white coming out, a little bit of green. Uh, but in, uh, day four, there's much more of this. And you see there's a, like a green tint. This is the color of the metarhizium spores. And day six, the, the dead body is now covered with uh, the uh, sporulating um, uh, metarhizium. Um, this is a characteristic magnified. This is the metarhizium in the center. Uh, it forms the spores form like a, almost like a scab, if you will. Um, and then Bovaria on the right uh, with a, a Mormon cricket that uh, uh, seems to have died happy, but it really didn't. And the fungus has emerged from all the, the uh, uh, weak parts of, of the cuticle around the mouth, the base of the antennae and so on and so on. Uh, but now the thing is with this outgrowth, it requires unbroken 100% humidity for two to three days. So in most cases, and it says certainly in agricultural use, the fungus dies with the insect, okay, which has good aspects to it, especially if you're a commercial company, uh, and as well as uh, 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 reuse. All right. Um, I've got to move something here. Okay. So I mentioned that there are different strains. So Bovaria bassiana, oh, oh that's stopped. Oh, there we go. As a species attacks all insects, okay? Many spiders, ticks, mites, things like that. But the different strains have different specificities. In other words, uh, they are preferentially more infectious for certain insects. And so here's some uh, more hypothetical examples. Um, so here's BB1. Um, then the lower the number, the more effective the strain is for that particular insect. So BB1 and white flies, aphids, and ligus um, are the, the really susceptible insects to this strain. Beetles, grasshoppers, less so. Army worm, yeah, mediocre. Uh, maggots, honeybees, and, and spider mites, much less uh, susceptible to that strain. Uh, switching over to BB3 for the moment, uh, it's a really good army worm killer, and it's mediocre to uh, barely infectious for uh, other insects. And then BB4 turns out to be a specialized uh, uh, pathogen of spider mites. Okay, so you have this, and that's why you have all of these different strains. Um, there's a, a no, number of criteria, not just virulence for insect targets, but mass production uh, and so on. So, so the different companies uh, focus on, on different strains. Uh, by the way, these things, these fungi, can, the reason they're commercialized is that they're very easily grown. Uh, think of them as talented bread molds. So in mass production, they are grown by the ton um, on uh, sterilized grain or rice or, or flaked barley, things like that. Um, and then as the spores can be harvested uh, um, through mechanical means to form the, the active ingredient, if you will. Okay, let's talk about uh, human and mammalian safety. These, fung these fungi are safe. They do not infect humans, except in rare instances uh, with severely immunocompromised uh, people. Okay, so uh, uh, contrary to uh, some of the recent, uh, was it last year we had, was it HBO, uh, The Last of Us? No, there's no Last of Us with these particular fungi. And they do not, uh, these fungi do, are not uh, zombie fun fungi as you may have seen in the popular press. Those are some other fungi that are not commercialized. 
Okay, there is, while they're safe for humans, there is some uh, sensitize, sensitization and allergic potential, okay? Especially with what are called wettable powder formulations, which are, are dry powders. Um, and they, they can potentially cause some sensitization, sniffles, uh, they can cause some eye irritation if you get it near. So there are a minimum set of precautions of uh, what we call PPEs, per personal protective um, devices uh, that are required for, uh, by EPA for their use. And you see a list of them there. Avoid contact with the eyes. Avoid inhaling the mist. Wear waterproof gloves, a long sleeve shirt and long pants. Uh, and then uh, some kind of dust, uh, dust or mist filtering respirator or mask, like the good old N95s that we've all gotten to, to know intimately the last few years. Um, and because of their safety, though, it, it, they're really is what they call a restricted entry interval of only four hours, which is, which is absolutely minimal. Okay. So in any case, if you're going to be using these, any of these products, read the product label and the, and the um, uh, safety sheet and follow that sheet. So you got to be safe. Okay, now, fact of life and death. One needs a lot of spores to kill an insect. It's not a, a single spore. Uh, so it's numbers, numbers, numbers. And to give you an example, um, the LC90. So the concentration uh, of spores to kill in a spray, like, let's say, uh, to kill 90% of the insect of Bovaria bassiana, strain GHA. For white flies, it's 100 spores per square millimeter of sprayed surface. For diamondback moth, it's 28 spores per square millimeter. Okay, what does that mean? Well, a flat hectare, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to go with metric system here, but the easy way to think about it is 2.5 acres to a hectare. So a flat hectare is 10 trillion square millimeters. <laughs> Okay, but that's flat hectare, and the, a plant canopy isn't flat. Uh, there's something called the leaf area index, which allows for the area of the foliage. And so using a, what we call an LAI of eight, which is typical for a good mature crop, um, we're now talking 80 trillion square millimeters in one hectare, okay? So all of a sudden you multiply those numbers, uh, the LC90s, and you're dealing with, um, these are numbers I'm used to working with. This is like a dozen or half a dozen uh, spores, if you will. Uh, 2.24 times 10 to the 12 spores for diamondback moth and a little uh, less than four times that for, uh, for the white fly per hectare. So how does that translate out? Uh, 0.1 quarts per hectare, uh, of a commercial product, Microtrol ESO, just for an example, uh, whereas white flies, you need a little bit more, so 0.4 quarts. But that's in a perfect world with the uh, efficacy based on a bioassay. Um, and why is that? Uh, th my best analogy is D-Day. Okay, so we've got, a, a, a without spending too much time, you've got a landing force of 50,000 spores um, that is in the air approaching the insect. Many of those are lost. They don't land on the insect, uh, whatever. So there's a tremendous um, attrition. Um, and um, so you're down to about 5,000 spores that actually hit the beach, okay, hit the insect. Uh, there's casualties. The, some of the spores don't germinate. Some of them don't attach very well. So uh, on the beach, you're down to uh, invasion force of 500 spores, okay? And they're trying to get into off the beach, using the D-Day analogy, get up into the, into the hedgerows, um, and not all of them succeed. And so you're down as, as the fungus gets into the interior of the insect, the, uh, it's, you're down to 50, 50, the progeny of 50 spores, okay? But the insect is not defenseless. It does have defenses, both of the cuticle in the cuticle. So think of them as, as the uh, uh, Nazi machine guns on the edge of the beach. Um, but then also inland, uh, the insects do counterattack. There is a series of cellular and biochemical uh, mechanisms that can, can, the insects have evolved uh, to 
uh, hold off weak invasions, if you will. Okay. And then finally, you get about seven survivors uh, uh, from all of these counterattacks. And these guys are the ones that uh, actually uh, multiply and kill the insect. So this, this is kind of the analogy. This is why you need hundreds or even thousands of spores per insect to, uh, to have high level of efficacy. All right, why am I not? There we go. All right, so but now the delivery of fungus spores is very inefficient. Uh, these are just some, some of the factors that affect uh, get, getting the spray of any, anything uh, to an insect. So the end result is that uh, for diamondback moth, you're actually having to go with a quart per hectare. With white flies, even two to three quarts per hectare uh, per spray, which is more work, more money, because these things aren't free. Uh, so this is a fact of life. So coverage, coverage, coverage is essential. So you've got to uh, really concentrate. You just can't spray this stuff willy-nilly. You have to aim for the insects and get the, the most bang for your buck. Or if you can't, uh, or if the insects aren't there yet, you, you spray where the insects will be, and so you want to maximize um, the spores per area of leaf surface. So you need a fine spray, you good wetting agent. Uh, you don't spray to runoff because everything then drop, drops off. Uh, the, the wetting agent just wets the leaves and creates a coat of of uh, spores on the surface of the leaf. And with things like white flies which live on the undersides of leaves, uh, leaves uh, you have to get that spray to those leaf undersides. And here you see some pictures of uh, greenhouse equipment that's used uh, not only for the uh, chemicals, but also for these, these fungi. Uh, what I learned from one poinsettia grower, you gotta be, you, you gotta be um, inventive sometimes. So here he uh, arranged his plants in elevated rows uh, and he sprayed from below sprayed up to get the white flies on the underneath uh, the undersides of those uh, poinsettia leaves. And he was getting very good efficacy this way, as opposed to trying to just spray, let's say with a backpack sprayer from above, none of that spray hits. In another case, um, you need a creative approach. This is something that I devised back in the 1990s for spraying melons. Um, it's kind of counterintuitive. So the track, those white uh, arrows are the direction of the tractor um, and the, the nozzles are pointing backwards and they're down in the canopy. So what happens is these, these what they call drop nozzles, you see those black nozzles, uh, they get the leaves moving, okay? They, but they don't hang up on the, 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 they don't tear up the leaves, they just get them moving. And with the backward spray, the spray goes mostly to the undersides of the leaves. And this way we were able to uh, get very, very good delivery of that fungus to where the white flies were. Uh, some, you can use additives, adjuvants. So in this case, uh, a particular wetting agent called Silwet, which is uh, kind of like the Mercedes Benz of wetting agents, if you will. Uh, actually allows the, uh, the wettable powder formulation of, uh, of the Bovaria, called Botanigard in this case, uh, to penetrate into those leaves or the, into those petals, uh, into the fifth and sixth petals, which is where the thrips were. And we got with, with uh, using the Silhouette with that Botanigard, we got really good efficacy against uh, roses. Um, oil is particularly useful. The spore Bovaria spore, Mitarizium spore is hydrophobic. So um, it readily goes into oil. So is the cuticle of an insect. And so uh, neat oil or oil and water emulsions, things like salad dressing can be better than wettable powders. And here's a, a really good example. Uh, this is with uh, some work done from the 1990s with African locusts. So there's one strain of fungus that has been commercialized for locust control. If you try to apply it in water with a little bit of, this, of just a regular wetting agent, uh, it takes a million spores to kill 50% of those locusts. But if you apply the same fungus in little uh, an aerosol of oil droplets, very tiny droplets, that LD50, as we call it, uh, drops to 8,900 from a million. 
So this shows you how uh, beneficial uh, oil carriers, oil formulation can be. And that's why most of the products that you see um, on the market today are uh, uh, some sort of emulsifiable oil uh, formulation. Uh, you have, so we ha also have wettable powders and these uh, oil formulations, which are here I've titled ESs, ECs, ODs. There's, there's a several different uh, descriptors. Uh, and sometimes the wettable powder is better. Sometimes the oil formulation is better. And without spending too much time here, um, so with thrips, um, the, uh, uh, the ES, which is the oil formulation, is less efficacious than the WP. For larvae, the, the two of them are equal. And it has to do with differences in the behavior of the insect between the adult stage and the larval stage. With aphids, uh, again, the ES is far more efficacious uh, for adults than the WP. On the other hand, with the immature aphids, the nymphs, they're equally efficacious and they're not quite as good. And that is because aphids molt very frequently, oftentimes uh, before the fungus can actually penetrate into the aphid. At the aphid has shed its skin, if you will, and has left the, the penetrating fungus behind. So there's, there's these considerations. Uh, so how do we deliver to, to some of these insects? You know, again, how do we use our creativity? So in one case, uh, with uh, gypsy moth larvae, Asian longhorn beetles, they crawl up and down the tree trunks. So one you can do is spray the tree bark. And so the insect crawls up and down and picks up the spores. Um, in Japan, for uh, uh, Asian, uh, well, it's actually it's now a spongy moth, uh, that, that name has changed. Uh, what the Japanese do is they take cloth uh, impregnated with Bovaria, the white fungus. And so the uh, spongy moth larvae crawl underneath that cloth are exposed to very large amounts of spores and uh, they're controlled. Uh, taking advantage of an insect's behavior. So a lot of fruit flies, like the cherry fruit fly with which I worked with, with a Canadian colleague, the larvae drop to the soil to pupate. Okay, well, let's put the infectious minefield down into that soil. In, in British Columbia, it's, it's even better because they grow grass underneath the cherry trees. Perfect habitat for survival of the fungus. So the whole idea is to not treat the trees, treat the soil underneath. And so you're interfering with the life cycle of, the, of that uh, fruit fly. Uh, here's another one, taking advantage of insect behavior, um, Bovaria for bed bugs. So the um, recommendation, application recommendation of the company that uh, has commercialized this is to put down a two to three inch barrier of spores in, in an oil between the bed bug and its food, i.e. people. So the bed bug crawls in, crawls across, twice across the, um, the, the minefield, if you will, picking up a, a lethal dose of spores. And when it goes back into uh, its cryptic habitats with its brethren, it can actually uh, transmit some of those spores mechanically to um, other uh, bed bugs and we get control. And so the recommendation in using uh, this Bovaria for bed bugs is to create these barriers, as you see here, those white lines, that's where the, the company recommends that the Bovaria be applied in various places again. So um, they're taking advantage of the insect's behavior as opposed to trying to get material uh, to um, the bed bug. Okay, or we can bring the insect to the microbe. Um, in uh, East Africa, they discovered that there's this compound methyl isonicotinate uh, commercial name is Lurum TR, is attractive to thrips, where you combine it with metarhizium fungus, and the thrips come uh, and dose themselves uh, because of this attractant chemical. Um, another example, which is actually commercialized in Germany now, is to create what, what are called alginate beads, which are about two millimeters in diameter, three millimeters diameter, containing not only uh, fungus spores, but also CO2 releasing yeast. Uh, 
Why that? Well, wireworms uh, are attracted to CO2 in the soil. And so there's this strong signal bringing the wireworms to what I call a fatal candy. So the wireworms come in and these, these alginate beads are a little soft, sort of a little like gummy bears. And the wireworm will start feeding um, on this and get infected through its mouth parts. And uh, this has been commercial now for about two or three years in, in Germany. Um, another, my last case of bringing the insect to the microbe is, is something that's been developed in Canada for emerald ash borer. Um, so this is what's called a Lundgren tunnel, which is an uh, attractive to the adult emerald ash borers. They, drump, they go into those funnels, they go, drop all the way down. At the very bottom is a cotton pad of sporulated bovaria. And so they, they dose themselves and then they disperse and they die of infection, but they also can transmit that infection to their siblings. Uh, another way is to uh, uh, dose the insects, not only to infect it, but also to vector that microbe to its, uh, to its kin. So this is a project I had in the Azores with Japanese beetle. These are modified Japanese beetle traps. They, the beetle crawls through this dish of sand and uh, metarhizium spores that's in here. Um, and you can see on the on lower right is a beetle that's emerged and it's, it's covered with, actually it's a uh, kaolin clay and, uh, and uh, metarhizium spores. And it is succumbs and there's a, a picture of, of it um, killed with a, with a bovaria fungus. Okay, and then we can use another uh, other insects. So um, honeybees, uh, who's determined, are not very susceptible for a number of reasons to uh, any of the Bovaria metarhizium uh, fun fungi. Um, so Canadians looked at disseminating Bovaria with the honeybees, they, and these special traps are made. As you can see here on the lower uh, left. Uh, and you see a, a bee on the right emerging and the, the yellow arrows are pointing to uh, Bovaria spores um, and, and a, a, a dust carrier um, on the legs of the bee. The bee then carries that out to flowers uh, and thoroughly contaminates the flowers to um, combat certain um, uh, flower attacking insects like thrips and, and, and a few other uh, species. Uh, so this, the Canadians have actually uh, uh, registered one of these uh, wettable powder formulations, Botanigard, for bee vectoring. It's on the label. Um, and two companies have actually now um, uh, taken advantage and devised systems to use bees to vector other fungi. So Bi BioBest is this flying doctors program, if you will. And then Bee Vector Technologies has another system. So you're using bees to transport your um, active, your fungi uh, to where they need to be. Okay, uh, environmental effects. What about temperature, sunlight, humidity, rain? Okay, let's deal with uh, temperature first. Uh, these fungi do have a tolerance. Uh, they grow best from 68 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And when it gets hotter than that, the growth drops uh, markedly. None of them really grow above 37C. Uh, when it gets colder, they just slow down. And you can see that the fungi actually, depending on the strain, will, will even grow slowly at 10 degrees uh, centigrade, which is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and this is an important consideration about when you're going to use the fungus. And here's an example. So this is Bovaria bassiana used against ligus in alfalfa. It didn't work in the field. We noticed that the temperatures were rather warm. Uh, they were actually in the high 90s when these trials were run. And the, the student, uh, uh, Takuji Noma, who was then at the University of Idaho, ran some studies. And he looked at, at uh, this Bovaria at 25 centigrade works great. At 35, it just doesn't, barely works at all. Okay. And at 15, it's working, but more slowly. If we ran this study out for maybe two weeks or three weeks, we would at the 15 degrees, we'd probably see it catch up to the 25. But the big thing is it's too warm um, for the fungus. So if, you, if, you're if faced with 
high temperatures. For example, uh, citrus in South Texas. I've been working with uh, APHIS there, and our uh, leaf temperatures are running 105 to 110. Um, yeah, the citrus survives, and the insects survive, but the fungus doesn't. So you can't use the fungus in really hot weather. What about sunlight? Sunlight uh, kills spores. It's the UV. Uh, on the upper leaf surface, uh, half-life, in other words, the time to kill half the spores uh, is one day. But when it's protected from blue sky, particularly the lower underside of the surface of the leaf, we can have half-life of nine to 10 days. What does that mean? Well, that means if you're going after an insect that is on the undersides of the leaves, there's, it's sheltered in a canopy, you don't have to spray as often as you might have to spray if it's an insect that's on exposed leaf surfaces. So exposed leaf surfaces, you're probably spraying every three, have to spray every three days. But with, uh, uh, with a situation where the spores are somewhat protected uh, by the surrounding plant canopy, uh, you can get away with spraying maybe once a week or even uh, once every uh, 10 days. What about humidity? Um, germination does require high humidity. Uh, however, ambient humidity can have little relevance. So there's, on a plant, there is a boundary layer of air, which is one to two millimeters in depth, uh, where the, the plant evapotranspiration creates a zone of 100% relative humidity. Uh, and here we have just stylized uh, white fly nymphs. So they're in 100%, even though the ambient humidity is 50 to 75%. The fungus can work. That's why I've been able to wake, make ovaria work in desert cotton. Uh, in, lar in insects, um, the cuticle also has a layer of high humidity. Uh, but maybe 0.2 millimeters, but that's deep, that's deep enough for the, uh, for the Bavaria spore to uh, germinate. Okay, so uh, ambient, uh, high ambient relative humidity is not required for infection, except maybe for large insects, locusts in exposed places. Um, and that's where oil, uh, oil and water uh, formulations really uh, counteract the low, uh, low humidity. The high humidity is required again for sporulation and recycling if one's, one wants that. What about rain? Okay, um, rain is affected, rain fastness is affected by the formulation and rate. If you have spores just in a wetting agent subjected to three inches of rain in an hour for, for 30 minutes, so in other words, an uh, uh, inch and a half of rain, the spores washed off if, because all they were doing was applied in just sort of a wetting agent. Uh, the orange bars are, um, or this orange bar on the right is a wettable powder formulation and it too is not very rain fast. Um, the two center ones are oil and there's a lesson to be learned here. And that's the concentration of oil in the spray can affect the rain fastness. So in this case, the orange bar, uh, it's a 0.13% um, uh, of formulation in the spray. Okay, it's not very rain fast. However, if you increase it to two and a half liters and 280 liters of spray in a hectare, in other words, 0.9%, look, it's completely rain fast from a really hard rain. So the formulation is a way of, of getting that persistence. And this is important where the, uh, you spray the crop and the insect moves into that crop. Let's say Colorado potato beetle. Um, it moves in to lay its eggs um, on that crop. And, and you wanna be able to uh, have some rain fastness. Okay, what about fungicides? Some fungicides that can be actually tank mixed. Uh, other fungicides uh, based on their chemistry uh, many of them are compatible if you put a little bit of time before or after you're spraying the fungus. And the manufacturers, the different manufacturers have on their websites um, recommendations of, let's say, uh, for, yeah, for example, uh, Benelate, well, that Benelate's no longer or at Quadris. Uh, if you, you separate the fungus from the fungicide by four days, you can, the two are compatible. They're not affected. Can resistance develop? Uh, it's unlikely. 
Um, the fungus is an active agent, flexible, unlike uh, a molecule, no lock and key as, as we have for chemicals. And we've, the, the people have tried to develop resistance to see if it'll happen. And uh, no, it hasn't succeeded. Um, the real problem is the way we're using these microbials. Uh, the tendency is to use them as chemicals often after a full insect pest outbreak is present and they don't work as well as a chemical, okay? So I keep saying microbes ain't no badger bullets. All right, so how can these microbes be used? The fungi particularly, not as a fire extinguisher, but as a fire prevention tool, okay? So that's very, very important. And also they have to be used in integrated pest management as one tool in a system, okay? Um, there's a definition here, we won't spend any time. Uh, the fungi are compatible with many biological control agents, pre uh, predators and parasitoids. This is a, just a partial list. Um, and it can be done. I'll give you some examples in the last uh, minute or two of my talk. So this is Duel Del Fuerte Tomato Farms in Sinaloa, 6,200 acres of uh, tomatoes. And it goes right away with identification, destruction of pest reservoirs in and around the farm. The big problem, white flies and secondarily spider mites. Using disease resistant varieties, uh, planting dates that are very carefully calculated to, to be not synchronous with the uh, biology of particular pests. Uh, there are large scale releases of parasitic wasps for the lepidopter for caterpillars. Uh, releases of predaceous mites, and okay, some short-lived safe chemicals uh, like fatty acid salts. Uh, then preventative treatment with Bovaria for wife fly control, intense scouting using GPS units. Uh, the, the, the farm workers go out with GPS units, they scout this uh, 6,200 acres, and when they see a hot spot, they mark it and they treat it with either a benign chemical or with Bovaria and the chemical sprays are a last resort. Uh, my last example, because I'm running out of time here, is a uh, clean start program in Canadian poinsettia. Um, this is being done. So the poinsettia cuttings, when they're re uh, uh, received by the uh, greenhouse grower to grow up into the plants that you buy at Christmas, they're immersed in insecticidal soap and Bovaria. Um, and this is compatible with uh, later the biologicals. And here's an example. So um, uh, in the first case, there's no control, okay? Um, they're, they're not dipped, uh, but there are biological controls and they don't do a very good job. Um, dipped with no bio, so just the fungus. Um, okay, it works, uh, it takes, you know, good six weeks before the, the white flies start building up. But the two of them together really suppress the population and the grower has got a fairly clean crop. Um, it's being done in uh, thrips uh, in greenhouse cucumbers in Canada. Here's This, this is how the Canadian uh, cucumbers are being grown. Um, I won't go into any details here, but uh, just to, uh, uh, to summarize this, metarhizium with um, a predaceous mite is a very, a very effective. So that's the orange bar or the yellow bar that you see here. It's better than the chem uh, chemical control, which in this case is a spinosad uh, for thrifts, but it's also really good for spider mites. So you see the chemical is really designed for thrips control. It doesn't control mites, so you'd have to use another chemical. But when you combine the predaceous mite with the metarhizium, you get some really good suppression of the insect. And this is an operational program, okay? And then um, just lastly, um, using lots of tools, using a fungus, botanigard, uh, MET-52, which is a metarhizium, weekly sprays with nematodes. Um, and you do, do this pot drenches and use predaceous mites, which are commercially available. Uh, and you take this all through the system um, and you then protect your crop. So this is how these microorganisms, particularly the fungi, can, should be used in an integrated pest management system. And with that, I will 
end my talk. Fantastic. Thank you for that. We do have a couple of questions, <clears throat> if you don't mind. Sure. Let's see. We'll go ahead and pull these up right here. The first question is, uh, have there been environmental issues with fungus lingering uh, besides its effects on humans? Well, no, because for one thing, in, in an outdoor environment, uh, the fungus just doesn't persist. You know, even, even in a shaded, protected spot, it's going to be dying off within um, uh, two weeks or so. In addition, in terms of its interaction with non-target organisms, what we found is that there are numerous, I'll call them behavioral as well as biological barriers that minimize the effect. So for example, there's a couple of different per, uh, parasitic wasps that can tell whether their host has a Bovaria infection or not. And if it does, they skip, they don't lay an egg in that aphid or in that white fly. They just go on and find an uninfected host. So there's, and, and we're seeing more and more examples of this. Uh, I think that uh, maybe, uh, certainly the, uh, in terms of environmental issues, um, uh, there's no harm for vertebrates. Um, EPA, um, as part of the registration process, um, requires a fair amount of safety testing uh, using vertebrates as well, uh, birds, uh, rodents, or you know, uh, or mice, um, what else? Well, certainly non-target insects too. Okay. Um, uh, our next question here is, what are some scenarios where this type of IPM would be used? Well, some of these examples that I just uh, gave you, you know, using um, the, uh, in greenhouse situation, which is I think one of the ideal uh, uh, situations where we've seen the most use of not just uh, fungi, but other microbials, um, uh, com coupling it with beneficial insects, with these predaceous mites, with parasitoids. And so, so you're attacking your pest situation with like a one-two punch. And again, you're doing a prevention. So you want to you wanna get those pioneer insects. Let's say if you're in a greenhouse or even in your farm field, you know, um, the insects, you're going to have pioneers coming in. And if you can get those, the populations just won't build up. And so, um, uh, so there's a, a really good example. Um, in, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think. Um, well, actually, if white flies in field crops, um, the re uh, release of parasitoids. This was done, this is a government program in uh, California and Texas where uh, a, the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service of USDA was mass rearing parasitoids and releasing them for white flies. Um, and um, the Bovary could also be used by the grower, by the farmer. Um, and it's again, uh, uh, a uh, additive effect, a complementary effect, the one, two punches I alluded to. So that, that's, uh, that's an example. Uh, the other example would be uh, doing cultural practice um, to attack other stages of the insect. For example, they overwinter. Many insects overwinter in the soil. Well, if you do tillage, uh, you can uh, hurt that population and reduce its survival so that next spring there's fewer insects, which are more easily controlled with these other tools. Um, I guess we can go on to the next question. Bovaria for bed bugs. Um, yeah, um, I don't know. I don't know uh, too much about the um, its competition with the chemistries, um, other than the you know it's it's fairly safe. Um, I have a coworker or a colleague here at Virginia Tech, uh, Dini Miller, who is um, um, in some way in some ways Doctor Bedbug, and she's been using this uh, Bovaria commercial product in uh, Richmond housing. Uh, and it seems to be working quite well. Uh, again, it's, it's a, uh, an alternative to uh, the chemical pesticides, particularly if there's some, some sensitivities. Um, okay, uh, let's last question. Uh, no, 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, it, um, the fungal infections in humans are human pathogen or uh, fungi that are pathogenic in humans to begin with. Let's say coccidiomycosis, uh, valley fever. Uh, in the in the southwest U.S., it's been there, and I think what we're seeing it, it's an exacerbation of human infections um, is climate change. It's warmer. It's uh, it con uh, conducive to more multiplication of of the fungi, but none of the uh, commercial um, fungi that I've listed here um, have shown any pathogenicity you know, other than in a severely immunosuppressed per, uh, people. Fantastic. Uh, I think that about uh, wraps it up for questions. Thank you so much, uh, Stefan, and thank you so much, Marsha, for your fantastic presentations. And um, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Yeah, uh, the last question, uh, I assume that's about bed bugs. No, there's no odor. Um, and even in the field, there's no odor. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Anyway, I got to go. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Right. Bye-bye.